live from Toronto, Canada, it's theCUBE. Covering Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit 2018. Brought to you by theCUBE. Hello everyone, welcome to the live coverage here in Toronto for the Blockchain Cloud Summit, Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit, here put on as prior to the big event this week called the Futurist Conference. The Cube will be here all week with live coverage. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. As we expand our coverage with the Cube into the blockchain and crypto token economics world, we're here on the ground with covering the best events. We started in 2018 initiating Cube coverage on the, on the sector. Of course, we've been covering Bitcoin and blockchain going back to 2011 on siliconangle.com. Dave, we're here to kick off what is the first inaugural event of, of its kind, combining cloud computing coverage with blockchain, and as we um, had on our fireside chat last night, we discussed this in detail, cloud computing and blockchain either going to be a collision course or it's going to be a nice integration, and we discussed that. This is what this show is all about. It's really about connecting the dots to the future, the role that cloud computing will play with blockchain and token economics a variety of different perspectives, but again, this is the first time we and the industry are starting to unpack the mega trend of cloud computing, which we know is like a freight train <laughs> powering and disrupting, and we cover it in detail, but blockchain certainly transforming, reimagining business and process coming together. Well, we're here in Toronto, which of course is the birthplace of Ethereum, and it's interesting to see how Toronto has attracted so many developers in the software and engineering, software engineering you know, space, and there's a huge crypto community here. I'd give you my take on the cloud and blockchain. I, I don't see them on a collision course. I see blockchain, and we've talked about this, and, and crypto as a part of this other layer that's emerging. You know, you had the, it, you know, the internet, you had the web, on top of that you had, you know, cloud, mobile, social, big data. And it was essentially a cloud of remote services. What we're seeing now is this ubiquitous set of digital services of which blockchain is one. And to me it's all about automation, machine intelligence, blockchain, being able to do things without middleman. You made that point uh, last night on the fireside chat. And I think it's complementary. You need cloud for scale. Everything's digital, which means data and you need machine intelligence for automation. And that is the new era that we're entering and blockchain is playing a big part of that because of its inherent encryption, its immutability, and its ability to show proof of work. So it's a key component of a number of different digital services that are going to transform virtually every industry. Certainly that's a tailwind for the industry. And certainly we see that all the alpha entrepreneurs, alpha geeks, and a lot of the business pros see blockchain and token economics is a dynamic that will certainly change things. Today in Toronto, this week, certainly not a good week for pricing of currencies. The crypto market is down, Ethereum is, and Ripple are at all yearly lows, um, and communities are kind of getting scared. Uh, we talked with Matt Rozak, one of the, um, an early investor and founder of Block last night about the price declines, and he said, quote, I've seen this pattern before, these price sell-offs also kick off the, the next wave of growth. So this kind of a weeding out was his perspective, but you can't deny that over the past 24 hours, 30 billion has been erased from the crypto <laughs> market caps, um, and the greatest decline has been the, uh, is happening under Bitcoin's dominance has still increased over, still 56% over the year. So Bitcoin seems to be holding more value than say Ethereum. Ethereum and Ripple really under a lot of pressure, but so the, the insiders are some are scared, some are like, hey, we've seen this movie before, waves are a little bit rough right now, but they're in for the long game. So this is a long, there's a long game going on, and then there's also money being lost. Well, Matt, I was, mean, Matt was saying, bet the farm now. He says, hey, you've seen this before, take everything, mortgage the house. I'm not sure I would advise doing that, but you know, this is the time, buy low. So, just as for the numbers, Bitcoin's high last, November, December was 19,000, it's down at 6,000 now. So as you say, it's still up almost 50% for the year, but if you compress that time frame to nine months, it's down 60%, so very, very volatile. Ethereum, on the other hand, last September was, was trading at around 240, 250, and today it's in the 260, so back to where it was last September. So the curve on Ethereum sort of looks like it did, you know, last, end of last summer, 
whereas Bitcoin is still almost 70% you know, up from where it was last September. So quite a bit yeah. of difference between the two cryptocurrencies. And you mentioned you know, Ripple, IOTA, no, many of the Ripple, Ripple dropping 90% from its 2018 highs, 90%. Right. <laughs> Some money was made and lost on that one. So again, we always say when the music stops, you better be sitting in a chair, otherwise, you know, this is bubble behavior. But you know, Matt and others and the insiders are saying they're still bullish because of the pattern. Even though there's a sell-off, it's a weeding out process and they see still good deals going on. And again, this is going to come fundamentally down to whose technology is going to be adopted, what kind of application can be written on blockchain. We're seeing some promise in the enterprise. Just yesterday, Microsoft announced a blockchain as a service kind of thing with proof of authority, a new concept. IBM, we've been covering IBM with blockchain. They're working with the Hyperledger uh, standards. So, you've got the enterprises. Amazon has kind of telegraphed, they've actually put a, a professional service note out where they are doing some blockchain. The big clouds are getting into the game. So the question is, Will the cloud suck all the oxygen out of the, out of the blockchain room? And will there be room for other blockchains? Again, this is the big debate. Is it going to be a fragmentation of a series of blockchains or will there be some sort of set of standards? Again, this, we don't know what the stack's going to look like because the best thing about blockchain is you could roll it out and, and implement a portion of the stack and still coexist with whatever standards emerge. So again, these are the questions. Well, one of the conversations that of course is going on is the, the actual the number of transactions that occurring with Bitcoin is way down, it's probably down 20% uh, year to date. The other conversation is, you know, we all know that, that, that Bitcoin and Ethereum, the transaction volumes, you know, can't really support what we, what we do with Visa or even Amazon. There's a discussion in the industry going around about what if Amazon chose some other coin, like Ripple, for example, which has much higher transaction volumes, or what if Amazon tokenized its own business, came up with its own cryptocurrency, what would that do to the price of, of Bitcoin if all of a sudden you could transact in Prime using you know, Amazon coin or something like that? I mean, so, and we know that Amazon understands how to scale, it obviously understands cloud. That's why I do see cloud and, and blockchain as complementary. I just don't, it's very difficult to predict the future. There are those who say, you know, Bitcoin is the standard, it's got the brand. There are those who say that Ethereum, because it's much more flexible and you can program distributed apps, apps with it, have a great future, and then everybody points to the transaction volumes and says this is just a, a, a petri dish for the future where new technologies will emerge that, that, that scale better and yeah. can produce. What's well, interesting, last night on the, um, we had a fireside chat with Al Bergio, serial entrepreneur, founder of Digital Bits, and Matt Rozak, obviously founder of Block, uh, investors on the Forbes billionaire list. Super active, very engaged on a lot of advisors, Binance is one and many other deals he's done. It's interesting, you got two perspectives. Al is the, the networking guy who knows plumbing, right? He knows the, how networks work, and Matt's a token economics genius. So the two uh, have interesting perspectives, and the battle royale going on right now, in my opinion, is two things. I think token economics is a wonderful uh, thing that's going to happen no matter what the standards are, because token economics really is the value to me of the cryptocurrency that can be applied to new business models and efficiencies. The blockchain is a land grab, and, I, and, and here's why. I think whoever can nail the plumbing on the pipes of the infrastructure reminds me of the early days of the dial-up web when you had points of presence and you had the infrastructure had to be laid down, although slow, people can dial up and get the internet, then obviously the internet got faster and faster. Blockchain's struggling from that scalability performance issues, and so the question is on a public blockchain, you got to have the super nodes, you got to have the core infrastructure plumbing nailed. I think Al Bergio takes that perspective, then everything else just will flourish from there. And so the question is, you know, what do those hurdles look like? And this is where the cloud guys could either be an enabler or they could be a foe against, the, against the, the core community. So, I mean, like you said, Amazon could just snap their fingers tomorrow and just like take out the entire industry with one move, right? Just, we're going to do our own blockchain as a service, everyone uses it, here's our token, and then, a set of sub-tokens would have to be coexisting with that, and that could be a good thing, we don't know. This well, is the and, discussion. And governments around the world could do the same. The US government could do FedCoin, you know, the Chinese government could do ChinaCoin. I mean, what would that do to the prices of cryptocurrencies? I mean, it would send it into a tailspin, you would, you would presume. And you know, it was interesting, M Matt, uh, at Rozak on your panel last night, I asked the question, will 
you know, traditional banks lose control of the payment systems. And granted, he's biased and his, he was definitive. Yes, absolutely, but the counter argument to that, John, and I'd love your thoughts on this is, the U.S. government and the banks have a lot to lose. And they're kind of in bed together and always have been. So, one would think, yeah. with the backing of the U.S., you know, it's might, it's military, et cetera, that they're not just going to let the bank lose control. Now, to his point is, why do you need to pay you know, transaction fees to, to a bank? But you're paying transaction fees well, to somebody even in crypto. I think our government in the United States is really asleep at the wheel on this one. I, and here's why. One of the beautiful things about the internet was it was started you know, through collaboration uh, in the universities in the United States. The United States enabled the internet to happen and the Department of Commerce managed it. The domain name system was you know, managed in a very community oriented way. Again, community, keyword, you know, postel, this, that history is, is well documented. If, if uh, people have, aren't familiar with the history of the domain name system, DNS, go check out the Wikipedia, research it. It was run by a bunch of people who managed a database of website names and that became sacred and was distributed. And, and funded by the U.S. government. Funded by the U.S. government, but the community managed it. The problem with the U.S. government today is that they are meddling in, in areas that they actually shouldn't be even playing in. You got the SEC shutting down everything right now just by the threat of subpoenas and, and the ICO market, which puts the overall country into a handicapped position because now the innovation of blockchain and the entrepreneurial innovation that's happening is stunted. And, and it's just shifting outside the United States. So what's happening is the money flow and the en energy and activity is so high that that incubation is not happening in the United States, although a lot of people are working on it. There's no funding mechanism. The capital formation of blockchain is different than venture. It's a little, not super different, but you know, somewhat different. But it's happening outside the United States. Certainly the Chinese will be benefited in, benefit of this, and if the Chinese wanted to shut down blockchain, they would have done it by now. <laughs> They're actually fostering it, and it's an opportunity for someone on the international stage to get a lever in the United States, so that's one. The second thing is, they can enable crypto if they wanted to, and I think they really should look at that, and I think the banks are, you know, central organizations, the World Bank, they're under a lot of pressure. They don't know what to do. So when I talk to people, that's the, the same answer in so many words is, the government and the regulators really just don't know what to do. Well, and, and Matt made the point last night, Matt Rozak, that you know, when he talks to these banks, they're talking about using blockchain and they're very excited because they're going to take hundreds of millions of dollars of cost out of their you know, uh, infrastructure and their processes that are just not very efficient and that's going to drop right to the bottom line and of course they're, they're in the money business so that gets them very excited. His point was, that's really not what it's about. Yeah, that's nice but it's really about transforming the businesses and that's why I asked the question about banks losing control of the payment systems, opens up a whole new opportunities, whether it's financial services, healthcare, automotive, and again, it, to me, it comes back to digital, which is data, plus machine intelligence, plus cloud for scale. That, you called it, uh, I think at IBM Think, you coined it, the innovation sandwich. Data plus machine intelligence plus cloud for scale, put that together, that is the innovation engine for the next decade plus. The, cloud, the innovation sandwich, unlike a wish sandwich where you wish you had some meat in the middle. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a good point. I mean, let's, let's end this, this kickoff and get in some interviews here with these really early thought leaders in this new kind of conference. It's the first of its kind, cloud and blockchain, and we're going to certainly continue this uh, in Silicon Valley with the Cube Summit coming up and our events that we do. But I want, let's get some predictions now, because remember, this is the queue, everything's going to be out there, it's going to be on the, on the record, so we can look back and say, hey Dave, remember in 2018 when I asked you what's going to happen, so let's get into a prediction. What do you think's going to help? I'll start, and you can think up an answer. So here's my prediction on this whole blockchain, blockchain world. Not so much crypto or token economics, it's really two predictions. With respect to blockchain, I think you're going to see an exact movement that the cloud market took and I think it's going to happen in three phases. Phase one is, all the energy is going to go into public blockchain, and public blockchain will be figured out first, and people are going to get excited by the new operating models of blockchain, specifically the decentralization of how that works and the benefits of decentralized blockchain, immutability, uh, no central authority, and all the benefits of blockchain. I think it's going to be very rapid growth in the fixing of blockchain. Speed, scale, that's going to happen very quickly, and it's going to happen publicly. Then you're going to see private blockchains. You're going to see you know, on-premises kind of like blockchain, kind of like the cloud, you know, people have on-site kind of private. And then you're going to see a hybrid. The hybrid will look like multi-chain solutions. 
So this is almost an exact trajectory that cloud computing took because this, the blockchain feels like a cousin of, of cloud or a brother or a sister, you know, so it's related but not exactly, but I think it's going to the same trajectory. Public, private, hybrid, which is a multi-chain model and I think that's going to be the, 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 the standards, that's going to be the, the market track. On the token side, I think you're going to see a couple key tokens, like certainly Bitcoin's not going away. I'd be doubling down on Bitcoin under 6,000, like everything on that. That should hit 20,000 in my opinion, pretty over the next time frame. But there's going to be a lot of token integrations. You know, my token integrates with your token and almost natives and secondary tokens kind of blending together. Where people will coexist tokens on one platform. So it's just too powerful not to have that happen. So that's my prediction. Well, what do you think? I think as it relates to blockchain, I think blockchain becomes, on the, on the, in the enterprise, I think it becomes an invisible component of virtually every industry. Because every industry has waste, can improve efficiencies, and blockchain becomes a way to, whether it's supply chain, or settlements, or shared ledgers, I mean, there's dozens of applications for them, and I think blockchain becomes a fundamental component of a digital infrastructure, and it's starting now, and I think it's here to stay for, for many decades and, and beyond. And you won't even see it, it's just going to be there. It's going to become a fundamental part of how we do business. On the token side, very interesting, obviously hard to predict. I, I think that you're going to see continued volatility, of course, I think that's a, a safe bet. But I also think it's potentially going to get worse before it gets better. I think there's going to be a shakeout. I think you're going to see, you know, there this continues to be pump and dump <laughs> scams going on. The U.S. government's getting more aggressive. A bunch of subpoenas went out, and people are still trying to understand what that all means. So I think it's going to be rocky roads for a while. I think you're going to see a big shakeout, like a big dip, and then I think it's going to power back. I think that crypto is, is here to stay, and it's very, very hard to time these markets. So my advice is just, you know, buy, trickle, trickle buys on the way down, and hold, hodl, as they say in this, in this world. And I think 10 years from now, it's going to be worth a lot. All right, you got it here, theCUBE. We are in Toronto for the first inaugural Cloud and Blockchain Summit, Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit. Of course, part of the big event here in Toronto, Futurist Conference, which will be there live Wednesday and Thursday. The kickoff is uh, Tuesday night for the opening reception. It's theCUBE coverage, continuing for blockchain and crypto markets. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Stay with us for more live coverage here in Toronto. <laughs>